Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Joy Newsroom. We're live on DSTV Channel 421. Go TV Channel 125 across all our social media handles. We're Joy News on TV. Coming up, three people dead and three others battling for their lives after a vocational dormitory collapse at Kaswa Timber Market. We'll hear from the National Fire Service, which says 17 people were inside the structure when the incident occurred. Also coming up, shop owners distraught as fire got some shops at Kaswa New Market will engage the fire service which is battling to douse the flames. We're also on the Accra Cape Coast Highway where four people have been confirmed dead following an accident involving three vehicles. And later, NBC flag bearer pledges swift investigations into the collapse of indigenous banks, National Cathedral, Financing and the Bank of Ghana, as well as other key issues within the first 100 days if elected. We will restore the licenses of wrongly, wrongfully collapsed banks and financial institutions. We will increase indigenous participation in the banking and financial sector. We'll hear from the former president who has described the governing MPP as the biggest political scam since independence. This MPP administration has been the biggest political scam that has been pulled on Ghanaians since our independence in 1957. Stay for some analysis on the key promises of the NDC coming up in the next 60 minutes. My name is Faustina Savo. Please be my guest. Thanks for choosing us for your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Three people have been confirmed dead and three others battling for their lives after a vocational institute dormitory collapsed at Kaswa Timber Market. The deceased include two females aged 16 and 18 as well as a carpenter. The fire service says there were 17 people inside the Richmond Vocational Institute when the structure, which was under construction, collapsed. Member of the public relations team of the fire service Assistant Divisional Officer 1 Alex Kingnate says other victims are responding to treatment. He joins us live with more. Thank you, Kingnate, for your time here on Newsroom. In your initial investigation, what led to the collapse of the structure? You would have to unmute for us to hear you clearly, please. Okay. Okay, um, so we are investigations are currently underway. But what I can say is that um, the structural integrity of the building seems to have been compromised um, by the looks of the the build the structure. When our officers arrived at the scene, they realized that the building wasn't even supposed to be a story build because the foundation lacked the strength to be able to withstand a two-story build. And then what we also got it was that the students, um, even though the building wasn't inhabited by students at that time, it was uh, students there were being used to help in the building of the, the dormitory. So at that point, we had about 11 of the students from the vocational school present, and we had six workers. So amongst the three people that unfortunately lost their life. We had two of the st female students, aged 16 and 18, and then we lost uh, the, one of the carpenters also. Mm. We know that three others are battling for their lives. What's the update on that? So um, currently, uh, our personnel are on their way to the hospital. We are hoping so far we've not heard. There was one lady who was in a very critical condition. She couldn't Walk. I mean, she couldn't talk. She couldn't even open her eye. And so it's our prayer that she pulls through and recovers much quickly. And so our officers are going there. There was a fire at Kaswa. So they just finished fighting the fire in the route to the hospital to ascertain the condition of this other um, um, victim.
Now we'll come to the fire you just made mention of, but let's stay with the collapse of the building. When your men got to the scene, what actually happened? So when our men got to the scene, um, so you see, when the incident happened, our personnel at Sec um, Kaswa were called in to the incident. The unfortunate thing was that they they were not adequately resourced when it comes to rescue. They were resourced to an extent when it comes to fight, but not adequately resourced when it comes to rescue. So they got there, started doing their, their best, and then had to call for reinforcement from our uh, specialized rescue team at our national headquarters, at Dankwa Circle. You can imagine how the distance from Dankwa Circle all the way to Circle, and all the way to Kaswa, to augment the efforts of the personnel there. So it took them about an hour to get there, and then upon getting there, they helped. We didn't think, we always say that we need earth moving equipment to help in our uh, rescue. So we had to rely on the MC. Alex, we seem to be losing connection to you. You would have to position rightly. If you just tuned in, we're giving you updates as to what See, happened. We then arranged for earth moving equipment to help us raise the rubble to be directed. Mm. We lost you briefly, so if you could just make your final point for us. Um, come again, please. We lost you briefly when you were making the final point, so if you could just run that um, again for us, we'll be grateful. Okay, so what I was saying was that mm. our officers, um, because we always make an appeal that we better resource, including earth moving equipment. Mm. So when we got there, we had to rely on the MCU to arrange earth moving equipment to help us raise the rubbles in order to pull out and rescue these victims. So in all, we had 12 casualties. Um, six of them were um, thankfully treated and discharged. And as you said, three are uh, in critical condition. Uh, they were taken to Kaswa Polyclinic and Kaswa Central Hospital, where we lost two of the victims at Kaswa Polyclinic and one at Kaswa Central Hospital. Mm. Now, you say your initial investigations point to the fact that the structure was not sound and fit for the kind of structure they were building upon. So what happens next? So, um, obviously, um, this was just the first assessment we did when we got there. Um, as I said, our, um, our personnel, our officers, uh, our director of patients and other key people are the site right now doing fair assessment. So, once we're able to ascertain that we didn't have the requisite permit or the documentation to come the building of set extract, um, and we realize that the a case for negligence, we uh, will do well to hand him over to the police for further investigation and prosecution if they need. Mm. Well, stay with me, Alex. We know that we are picking information that some shop owners are distraught after fire got at some shops at Kaswa New Market. Um, your men are on the ground. What's the update on that? So, um, as it stands now, the fire, which that we got the call and got there around within 10 minutes, our officers from Castle mm. got to the scene. And within two hours, they were able to put the fire under control. Uh, but for some um, obstacles or challenges we faced, I'm sure the effect could have been a bit more reduced because. One, accessibility was a problem for us. Um, we didn't have enough access into the market. So if you watch through the video, you realize that uh, we had to pass a lot of horses into the market. So meaning that we had to pass our fire tenders very far away to be able to pull through, which is not the best. So we would ask that uh, in the future or whenever markets are being constructed, access routes should be prioritized so that Whenever there's an emergency, emergency responders will be able to get there on time. Would mm. also, uh, one thing we also encountered was attack from uh, people around. This is one thing we've been speaking against for so long. And it's unfortunate that in such an era, this unfortunate trend is still happening. So we had to call on the police to come and uh, in, uh, maintain law and order before we were able to fight the fight.
So, but for this, I'm sure we could have mitigated. So we ended up losing about 74 shots mm. in the process, but thankfully we're able to salvage and contain the fire from spreading to about 1,000 shots within that same area. Mm. And so far, what's the extent of damage? And clarify for me, why exactly were your personnel being attacked? You see, um, so it's unfortunate that people still have the age of uh, um, thinking of attacking firemen whenever they a fire. They should remember that we don't set fires, we fight fire. So when they tend to attack our men, and we are, using, we are wasting time trying to mediate, trying to find alternative routes to get to the scene, the fire is no way. The fire is fast spreading. And especially for a market like that, that is full of combustible material. You can imagine how uh, difficult, how rapid the fire would spread. So the extent of damage, as I said, um, about 70 stalls were damaged in this, um, 70 stalls and its contents. The contents included um, tubers of yam, rice, beans, basically food stuff that we use, oil. And we all know how very uh, tricky oil, fires involving oil is. You, you know, you need um, to use foam concentrate. You just can't pour water on fires like this, and they tend to spread much faster. So it was a challenge, but uh, under two hours, we were able to keep the fire under control from feathers. In your initial assessment, what actually triggered the flames? Um, well, um, investigations like this take a lot of time. So mm. for now, we can't tell. But one thing that normally runs through with market fires could be cooking even in the market. That's one thing we've been discouraging people from doing, from cooking in the in the markets. It tends to, um, because you realize that when you cook, and then you probably are using a chap, when you dispose of the chap, uh, if you don't dispose it of wood, it might fall on a combustible material such as a wrap or a wrap. You might not see the fire at one, but we have what we call small drop where the fire will take its time to develop at a slow pace. So by the time it fully develops and you know, develops into a full flame, people might not be around to be able to put it out at the initial stage, and then it might get out of hand. So it could be anything from, um, from cooking, it could be anything from illegal connection, it could be anything. But for now, we can't pinpoint a particular cause of the fire. Okay, thank you so much for your time here on Joe Newsroom. Let's head now to Cape Coast. News coming in indicates that four people have died with several injured after a sprinter bus collided with an articulator truck at Atabaze and Cape Coast on the Takrade Cape Coast Highway. Well, here is Dr. Papa Kujumbro, head of emergency unit at Cape Coast Station Hospital with further details. We received about 12 people in the ER having been involved in an RTA. They are all being taken care of. Unfortunately, we have lost four of them. Among of the four who were dead was a woman and a, a baby. All the rest are being continuously assessed as a security right now. Okay, so how many people can you confirm were brought in? I can confirm that about 12 people were brought to the emergency department. Well, the four people who were brought to the emergency department, two were brought in dead, and two unfortunately did not make it whilst we were doing the station. But the rest are still being assessed as I'm speaking to you right now. Well, Eric Asante is our central regional correspondent. He joins us live with more. Eric, you've been talking to some of the witnesses. What actually triggered this accident? <laughs> Eric, you would have to position rightly. We seem to be losing connection to you. If you just tuned in right now, 14 people and several have been injured as a result of an accident on the Cape Coast Takrade Highway. Um, what we can confirm is that four people at the hospital have died and we're just getting updates that that figure of the number of people who have died 
has been updated to 14. Our correspondent, Eric Asante, is joining us from the central region. I'm hoping I have better connection to you, Eric, this time on phone. You've been speaking to eyewitness. What did they say triggered this accident? Um, so, of course, the, the police are yet to confirm what led to the fatal accident this morning. Mm. But some survivors have indicated to us that the crash occurred when a truck from Sakrari to Accra tried to overtake in a sharp curve, thereby colliding um, head-on with a sprinter vehicle um, that was moving from Manfall to Sekendi. Uh, we are thinking that the occupants, or most of the occupants of the sprinter vehicle, were actually fishermen and fishmongers uh, who were moving from Manford here in the central region um, to um, Sekendi in the western region. So far, uh, we can confirm 14 people have lost their lives uh, when I visited the mortuary and, of course, the uh, emergency unit at the Cape Coast City Hospital. Um, I have with me some family members of um, some survivors um, who I would want to find out um, from them how they got information and how they are reacting to the information. Madam Bocho, what about in our county assembly then? But I am just a number. I am my team. I'm a summit drummer, can't if you drummer, or a station can or load it. If you say, don't look at the answer from a wabana. What's the sun about what's the way you are saying? I'm a yoko fear. Yoko and I am, I mean, baby, what's this? I mean, I know me once a better. Yoko, I'm up for much of a mommy. Then we're going to call you person. That's the initiative. You can send away. Yes, I'm in the day. Like our emergency, what would that? What should I want to share? Um. So, um. For essentially, she says that a district call, and when she visited the Cape Position Hospital, it was confirmed that a family member of um, her was involved. I was part of those who I'm um, the survivors of the um, accident. So, I'm chaotic team here at the emergency, as um angry um family members would want the officials to hand. I got to them the driver of the truck vehicle. I can confirm that the driver of the truck vehicle, um, I mean, is around, and of course, the security personnel here have warded off so that the family members don't get through to him. So, this is what we can confirm from the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital. Mm. Initially, you reported four dead, now 10. Clarify how we got this figure. Now, 14. So, um, 14 people have been confirmed dead. Mm. I mean, from the um, that is official from the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital. Initially, 10. I, I could identify 10 people when I visited the mortuary um, um, this morning. When I came to the emergency, four other people died. Um, I'm, I'm totaling 10. I'm 14. So in all, 14 people have lost their lives in that um, fatal accident that occurred um, this morning here in the central region. Thank you, Erica Sante is our central regional correspondent. And we are your election headquarters. Election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol Platinum Energy, Energizing Dreams, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, SIMA, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, AICPA, together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Also brought to you by Chopbox Technologies, a convenient service, and Youth Breach Foundation, bridging the gap for positive youth development. Well, the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Dramani Mahama, is promising swift investigations into the collapse of some indigenous banks, the financing of the National Cathedral, the Bank of Ghana, and others within the first 100 days of his administration should he win the December 7 presidential election. This is part of 21 key things he intends to do within the period. Speaking at the launch of the party's manifesto at the University of Education, Winneba, the former president also announced investigations into the spillage of the Akosobo Dam and a short compensation will be paid to those affected. We go through our 120 day social contract. The things we'll do in the first 120 days after we leave Independence Square on 7th January 2025. And then after that, I'll call our general secretary and our chairman and Nana Jane to join me up here so that we launch the manifesto. So um, one, 
We will put in place a robust code of conduct and standards for all government officials in line with the principles of ethical leadership, modesty, humility, integrity, and accountability. We will nominate all our cabinet ministers for parliamentary approval within the first 14 days in office. We would have named all our cabinet ministers. We will constitute the leanest and most efficient government in the history of the Fourth Republic in the first 90 days in office. We will hold a national economic dialogue to discuss the true state of the economy and prepare a homegrown fiscal consolidation program to guide the budget. Number five, we will commence the drafting of needed legal amendments and preparation for the implementation of the 24-hour economy policy under the office of the President. Number six, we will establish a, a, an accelerated Export Development Council, which I will personally chair, to promote exports as part of a broader strategy for economic transformation. Number seven, we will convene a national consultative conference on education with CHAS, NAGRAT, NAT, CCT, NAPS, CETAG, Vice Chancellors Ghana, Prinkoff, TEWU, UTAG, PTAs, students, think tanks, academia, parents, and other stakeholders to build consensus on the improvement of our education sector, including the free SHS. Number eight, we will scrap the following draconian taxes to alleviate hardship and ease the high cost of doing business in our first 90 days in office. One, e-levy. Two, COVID levy. Three, betting tax. Four, emissions levy. And we will review taxes and levies on vehicles and equipment imported into the country for industrial and agricultural purposes. Nine, we'll introduce the no academic, academic fee stress policy for all first-year students in public tertiary educational institutions, in universities, in technical universities, in polytechnics, colleges of education, nursing training institutions, under our no fee stress initiative. <laughs> We will budget for this, and the money will be given to the Student Loan Trust. It will register all the level 100 students, and it will pay the money to their universities on their behalf so that they don't have to go and pay anything. It will be a grant. It will not be a loan. It will be a grant, so they don't have to pay for it. Ten, we will introduce the, social the following social intervention policies. One, free tertiary education for persons with disability. The Ghana Medical Care Trust fund, which will be a fund that will help uh, uh, the, uh, the treatment of kidney ailments, uh, hypertension, uh, heart disease, high, high blood pressure, and all those kinds of things. We will commence, within 120 days, the distribution of free sanitary parts to female students in basic and secondary schools. Well, the former president also criticized the ruling MPP for poor governance, which he claims has plunged the country into economic crisis. He stated that the current MPP administration has been the biggest political scam that has been pulled on Ghanaians since independence. This MPP administration has been the biggest political scam that has been pulled on Ghanaians since our independence in 1957. And I'll explain why. They were repackaged with ribbons and sweetly scented with enticing promises. Most Ghanaians will agree that Nana Akufuado is indeed the president Ghana never got. And indeed, I dare say, his much touted economic waste kid, Vice President Dr. Ba Mahmoud Baumia, is also the economic messiah Ghana never got. Today, the majority of state owned enterprises 
are posting massive losses. The COVID pandemic, rather than being an adversity, turned out to be a bless blessing with a windfall for this government of almost 25 billion Ghana cities of inflows, most of which were doled out to companies owned by family and friends. The majority of our citizens are convinced that our country, Ghana, is going in the wrong direction. Faith in our democracy is at its lowest, and many of our youth do not believe that constitutional governance is working for them. Faith in our democratic institutions and the political leadership is at its lowest ebb, and corruption is at its highest, and Ghanaians have become numb to the scandals that are exposed almost every week. And, you are, and when you have a president who says he does not understand the halabaloo that is being made about the sale of snake hotels to a minister in his own government, then clearly he is on a completely different wavelength from the rest of us in this country. On the much talked about 24-hour economy model, Mr. Mahama unveiled a support package aimed at stimulating Ghana's 24-hour economy, the plan designed to energize businesses that operate around the clock, including a series of strategic initiatives to drive demand for goods and services in the sector if the NDC is elected. This is the 24-hour economic clock. One job, three shifts, three people. One, three, three. One job, three shifts, three people. Obiabe Didi. Ezu. Extraordinary problems require extraordinary solutions for extraordinary results. And so businesses and public organizations will be encouraged to operate 24-7 in three shifts of eight hours each. This will boost production, it will increase employment, and provide well-paying jobs. It will transform Ghana into an import substitution and export-led country. It will increase employment opportunities and revenue, and it will enhance access to public services. We will focus on some selected public institutions that have huge customer traffic. For instance, the ports and harbors should be open 24-7. That means we have to employ more workers at the port, we have to employ more customs officers, more GAPOHA uh, workers, more forklift operators and all that. We need customs. Customs should work 24-7, three shifts, so that at any time your items come, customs at any time of the day is open for business. You can go and process your uh, import things, uh, papers, and take your things out of the port. We must have a passport office that is operating longer than eight hours, so that people who need passports and other site documentation can have access to it. We must have a DVLA that is working more shifts than one shift so that more people can get their licenses processed in a shorter time than the current waiting time. In the private sector, the sectors that we are looking to promote and encourage to run 24-7 and 3 shifts are first the agro-processing sector. That is, those who will process our cassava into cassava starch, cassava flour, gari, and all that. There's a huge market in Africa for all these products and in other parts of the world. Manufacturing, that is industry. Is manufacturing, that is industry. And so the textiles industry, the fruit uh, juice making industry, all the industries, the iron and steel industry, will be encouraged to run 
the pharmaceutical sector. We want Ghana to be the pharmaceutical hub of the whole of Africa so that we'll produce medicines here and export them to all other African countries. Away from politics, the Electoral Commission has assured the public that the integrity of the 2024 election remains secure despite the arrest of an individual in Insawam on Friday found in possession of a biometric verification device. The Commission says that a BVD in unauthorized hands cannot jeopardize the election given the robust security protocols and technical safeguards in place. Well, in a statement signed by Sam Tete, the deputy chairman of the operations, the EC revealed an internal investigation is ongoing to ascertain how the culprit gained possession of the BVD in question and the commission, in collaboration with the police, would work together to fully address the incidents and find who did what. Well, Maxwell Gawa has been going through this statement. He joins me live with more. Maxwell, the EC says a stolen BVD cannot be used to compromise an election. What explanation did they give? Well, they've been essentially um, dismissing the potency um, of the stolen BVD to compromise um, an election um, here in Ghana. And they give their reasons as follows. This is one, a stolen BVD cannot be used to compromise an election. BVDs undergo a rigorous preparation process and only devices prepared for a specific election can be used. Now, they say that the voter verification app works only with data that is securely prepared, audited, encrypted, and um, signed. On the issue of activation and data um, integrity, they say that BVDs require activation codes from the EC secure system accessible only to authorized officials, and that the data on the BVDs must match the voters register um, for each polling station. Now, the EC is also saying that the voter data changes with every election cycle, making unauthorized BVDs unusable uh, for the uh, upcoming December 7, 2024 uh, elections. Now, on transparency measures, um, the EC says political party agents observe the parking of BVDs and record serial uh, numbers. Now, serial numbers of BVDs are also recorded on the pink sheets uh, for polling for each polling station. Now, the EC says um, it is collaborating um, with the police to investigate the circumstances surrounding the authorized, uh, unauthorized, I should say, possession of the BVD in, in Sawan Fosina. Thank you, Maxwell Agwagwa. Let's do some other stories now. The finance minister, Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam, is this afternoon disputing claims that government used the MP's common fund to finance a district road improvement program. Stay with us because we'll bring you details after this quick break. Thanks for staying with us. Now, Finance Minister Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam is disputing claims that government used the MP's common fund to finance the district road improvement program. He said the program is solely the legacy of President Nanado Akufado and the NPP, adding that it was funded through a loan the government secured. He made these remarks at a short ceremony in Tamale to hand over the equipment to the districts in the northern region. The DRIP program aims to address road maintenance challenges by collaborating with metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies and equipping them with earth moving machines. Speaking at the handing over of the equipment in Tamale, the finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, said government has invested 10 billion Ghana cities in the road sector since January this year and determined to end the year with another investment of 7 billion Ghana cities. Let me also use this platform to dispel falsehoods that is moving around in some of our districts and constituencies about the source of this equipment. This project is a government of Ghana project under the leadership of His Excellency Nana and Dr. I have heard some parliamentary candidates say that their share of common fund, MP share of common fund, were put together and under the instructions of the MPs. 
the government used that money to procure this equipment. We have invested 10 billion Ghana cities in the rural sector alone since January 2024. And we are determined to end the year with another investment of 7 billion Ghana cities again in the rural sector. The overlord of Dagbon, Danyana Abukari II, admonished the MMDAs to use the equipment with integrity. His speech was read by the spokesperson, Zangbalanlana, Dr. Yakubu Mahama. The 2,240 units of road equipment symbolize our chance, our opportunity to build a better future. There are tools of change, progress, and opportunity that should not be taken for granted. With the creation of over 10,000 jobs for local engineers and artisans, we are not only improving infrastructure, but also uplifting lives and creating hope for a better tomorrow. For this reason, I urge all MMDAs to utilize this equipment with integrity and diligence. Let's ensure that as soon as we get back to our stations, plan preventive maintenance systems for the equipment to ensure that we need for as long as it's possible with minimal maintenance costs. The Northern Regional Minister Shani Al Hassan Shaibu said the region will benefit 131 equipment programs, adding that it will help augment the road challenges the region is facing. The region will benefit with six wheel rollers, three board rollers, three number low beds, bringing the total number of equipment to the region. 131 equipments. Let's take you now to the Bunu region where the district road improvement program has been locally launched. The regional minister is um, concerned about it and he says that Kwesi Edujang says he's expressing optimism that the initiative will significantly expand road networks and enhance accessibility and mobility for rural communities. He highlighted that the improved infrastructure could address issues relating and related to post harvest losses where harvested crops often go to waste due to poor rural road conditions in the region. And as Sabit has more in this report. The Bono East region as part of government's district road improvement program received a total of 89 road improvement equipments aimed at helping resolve road infrastructure challenges across the country. The equipments, according to the Bruno East Regional Minister Kwesi Adujan, are expected to play a crucial role in addressing the deplorable state of many road networks across the Bruno East enclave. This is one of the visions of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, that no rural area, no town or village should be left aside when it comes to the development or infrastructure development. For that matter, we in Bruno East region have been given a total of 89 road improvement and rehabilitation equipment to equip the assemblies with the necessary equipment. In addition to this, we are also providing capacity building and skill development that will enable these equipment to perform effectively and efficiently in the respective areas that will be allocated. Mr. Dujan, who lauded the present for the initiative, is optimistic that the equipment will help open up the road networks in the rural settings, thereby making farm produce accessible to buyers. There have been many, many times that we've seen yams, tomatoes, vegetables rotting in the rural areas, all because the roads are not motorable. The rural areas are not accessible. This is going to open up the village, the rural areas, the bread baskets of this country so that food can easily be transported from these villages and towns to the main shopping area where they are most needed. It will also help the farmers to, to recuperate the capital that has been invested into farming. Bono is regional manager of Zoom Lion, who spoke on behalf of GA Plant Pool. A subsidiary of the Jospon Group, who are partners to the project, George Manu said steps are already taken to ensure that all 89 equipments are taken care of in terms of maintenance and servicing. As a way of getting the sustainability of this program, 
the JO plan two is in partnership with the to supply the spare parts for the maintenance and servicing of all the equipment. We are going to be taking care of the fueling, the supply of the materials for the maintenance of our roads, so that there will not be any occasion where the assembly will be cash trapped or there will be a breakdown of any facility and the assembly cannot maintain. Speaking on behalf of the 11 MMDCs across the area, District Chief Executive from Kranzan North, Peter Osefusu, said the new equipments would go a long way in solving the old age challenge of bad roads across the rural settings. That's a very important day for us as MMDCs because most of us are operating in rural areas and road network has been the bane of our rural development. And most of the time we realize that when they say the road is not good, it is not the entire stretch. There may be some costs that can cut the whole community off. So with the commissioning of this project, that the drip project, it is going to solve most of our problems regarding uh, commuting in the rural communities. The 89 road improvement equipment is said to create over 1,000 direct and indirect jobs across the Bono East region. <laughs> Anna Sabit, Joy News, Tichima. Let's head now to Parliament. The Public Interest and Accountability Committee has conducted a significant project inspection tour in the North Dye and South Dye districts of the Volta region. This tour is part of PIAC's ongoing efforts to promote transparency and accountability in the management of Ghana's petroleum resources. Our correspondent provides more details. During the tour, the team expressed concerns about some facilities being underutilized and left to deteriorate. The PIAC team began their tour in the North Dying District where they inspected strata pavement at the Amfoyga main market. This development is expected to enhance the market's infrastructure, providing a better environment for traders and boosting local commerce. PIAC, as part of its uh, mandate, carries out uh, independent assessment of how petroleum revenues have been used and accounted for. So we've come to Amfuega uh, to inspect some projects that have received petroleum revenue. We are at the market square where a paving contract was awarded to be done, uh, I think in 2019, thereabout. Um, our inspection reveals that uh, the work has been completed but uh, it requires some minor remedial works, which we have brought to the attention of the engineers of the assembly to get the contractor to remedy. So by and large, we can say that uh, the revenues have been appropriately utilized on the project. And as the team visited the Volta School of Technical Education, Vastec, where they assessed the newly constructed kitchen facility, this project also is aimed at improving the learning environment for students, contributing to the overall quality of education in the district. Come to Vaku Secondary Technical School to inspect a kitchen facility that had received funding from uh, petroleum revenues. Unfortunately, um, we didn't get access to the building, even though the building has been constructed and completed about three years ago. Um, we've observed some uh, defects on the building, as well as not having clarity on the purpose for which the building was constructed. The reason is that the school needs a kitchen to feed um, the students, to cook for the students. And it also needs a kitchen for students training and catering services. So we are not too sure whether this building was, was built with intent to serve the school's needs in constructing, I mean, in feeding the children or whether it was built for the purpose of training the children. The inspection also covered an art gallery in Vakbo Township, a cultural hub that showcases the community's rich artistic heritage. 
the gallery is expected to play a crucial role in preserving and promoting local art and culture. We've come to see the facility. It's been constructed, but there are a lot of things wrong with it. And uh, the facility is not, also not being put to use, which is unfortunate because it's been completed about three to four years ago. This project, from observation, has serious defects in its roofing, which has resulted to leakages in the ceiling and virtual collapse of the ceiling onto the ground. One of the rooms is virtually filled with water, and uh, you can't see any commercial activity going on. You can look at the compound, which is all overgrown with weeds, and this is not the way we will expect oil revenues to be applied. We need to get benefits and value for the money spent. This doesn't indicate that we are getting any benefit from the investments made, and it needs to be looked at again. It is our hope that the district assembly will be up and doing and put the gallery to its use for which it was constructed. The tour extended to the southern district where PIAC reviewed progress on the Agenda 11 project. PIAC conducted town hall meetings in both districts to educate the public on the utilization of Ghana's petroleum resources. Ivy Satoji for Joy News and Fuega. As Ghana prepares to go to the polls in December, entrepreneurs have been pleading with political parties to prioritize policies that will stabilize the local currency. We'll give you details when we return with business news. As Ghana prepares to go to the polls in December, entrepreneurs have been pleading with political parties prioritize policies that will stabilize the local currency. They say the rate at which the city depreciates against the dollar makes business struggle. At the 20th anniversary celebration of Forever Leaving Products, country manager Michael Barfour says political parties should focus on creating an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. Based on nature's gifts, the greatest gift from nature to mankind, which is the aloe vera plant. And so we produce so many products that help people live healthier lives. And we have a unique business system that helps people to make money. Okay, and these monies people use as supplemental income. They use it to help them uh, themselves in their daily lives and so on. And in the process, so many lives, like thousands of lives have been transformed in Ghana. For us, for us uh, as a business, the key thing that we are looking for is a stable currency. Um, because a significant aspect of our business in, is involved uh, in importing uh, products into the country. And if you look at the range of taxes that we have to pay at the port, on top of that, the currency, um, every day, every <laughs> each day and out, uh, depreciating, uh, it's, it's not really very good for us. Okay, so if we have a very stable currency, we can plan. Okay. Our Vice President for Forever Living Products Africa, Jean Baptiste Amishai, emphasized on the need for government to create a conducive environment for businesses to thrive, adding that government should consider tax rebates for businesses which employ a considerable number of the population, thereby reducing unemployment. Yeah, I think when we celebrate 20 years, the first thing is to thank the government because when you are here, it means that the general environment during the 20 years have allowed the company to stay here to do the business. And of course, we know that we can improve. Talking about good health, talking about additional income, so it's just transforming lives. 20 years. So when you see someone who wears paints of forever, it means that it has touched lives. It has changed the environment. It has changed the lives of the people that you have met because now they have better lives. Now we have better income. Now they are able also to change life around them. So what do they have? They need to help in tax because when you start your business, you need to accumulate some money first before you start to pay taxes because it's your own investment. You are not asking for any subsidy, but to have a conducive environment. Conducive environment is tax, is also allowing people to, to talk about health, to talk about what they need, 
and to give them this conducive environment so that they can go everywhere in the country. Well, that's it for Joe Newsroom. For more news, please log on to myjoeonline.com. My name is Faustina Safo. Up next is the law and Samson will be in the studio shortly.